Uh-huh. Okay. Says we're live. Welcome, welcome. All right. Hello. Today, I am so excited to be interviewing Donna Hamilton. She is a pediatric occupational therapist who specializes in feeding. What a pediatric dietitian loves is a pediatric occupational therapist who specializes in feeding. So I have um, referred uh, um, mutual patients to Donna over the years. She's currently at um, Bold Pediatrics in Beaverton, Oregon. And she's here with us today, gonna answer some questions on just that um, sensory piece, the barriers around sensory related to picky eating. So welcome, Donna. <laughs> the big topic. It uh, is a big thank topic. you, it's so good to be here. I'm glad I can make myself available and, and share more information just to help us hopefully set up more positive experiences with our kids and make meal times more fun. So yes, that's what it's all about. Um, so if anyone pops in and watching, feel free to put a question in the comments. But um, I have certainly want to just dive in right away and and ask um, Donna to please tell us in your own experience how you feel a child's sensory system can interfere with their ability to eat a variety of foods. Right, and as we know, there's so many different reasons why our kids can struggle with eating, but sensory processing does tend to be a big one. Um, and I think that when we think about sensory processing, how we, we walk into a room and we interpret so many different information from our, our nervous system, um, we can see there can be a breakdown in more than just eating in lots of different areas of development. Um, but just to think about our in relationship to feeding and eating and having positive meal times, um, often we'll see that tactile processing system, so the touch processing system. And I usually like to share that really the skin on the outside of your body is no different than what's in your mouth. So um, when we see, we might see children be avoidant of wanting to touch even certain art materials or play materials, but also when you there's a food in front, they're very cautious about their hands being messy or um, maybe only wanting to use utensils and not wanting to do any kind of finger feeding. Um, often um, I'll see children that really struggle with toothbrushing and, um, or they might um, cater only to one type of food feeling or texture in their mouth and they'll limit their food just based off of how that texture um, feels safe to them. And, um, and that tactile, that tactile processing, even when we think about washing our hands and transitioning to the table, that can be shut down there if the soaps or the feeling of soap on the hand is too much. And these are situations that are more, I should back up, are more over-responsive. And the tricky thing about the nervous system is you can be over-responsive and you can be under-responsive where you're not registering the information very well, which can also be problematic. Um, and of course, wouldn't it be perfect if we could just be one or the other? A lot of times that can change based off of who our kids are from day in and day out. Mm -hmm. um, taste, um, children can be either, um, they can be very picky about bland, they like bland taste, they don't like a lot of spice, or they might be that kid that wants sour and big flavors and, um, and is really selective and, and needs that extra input to know where things are in their mouth. Um, smell, we might have children that you know, run from the kitchen because the smells are too big, um, they might gag in response to smell. Um, or you might have children that they seek that out. They need that smell. They like to smell everything, even things that you're like, why are you smelling that? Um, mm -hmm. And it might, and, and might not make much sense, but to them, they're just trying to get as much information as possible. Um, you think about the auditory system, so how we're hearing and processing all that sound around us. Kitchens are noisy, especially if you have mm -hmm. big families. There's a lot mm -hmm. going on. Um, uh, even the eating process itself, there are kids that Will come, I have a lot of my older kids that can tell you that they don't like the sound of chewing, they don't like the pulling the, the food off of the utensil. And so um, those things can be, or setting the fork down on a plate can create a lot of noise and sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and visual aspects of food, a lot of times we'll, we'll have children that need food to really look a certain way. Um, and that can be really universal across the sensory processing system because it creates predictability. Um, but we might have children that want really not a lot of color to their food. You might think their diet is really like not real exciting because it's more white and beige. And then there's kids that like a lot of intense flavor. Um, we have kids that, that don't want their food to touch at all. And the visual mixing of food just can even make them gag. Um, so that can be very overwhelming. And I think a really big one, because when we think about eating, we don't really think about our body. 
Um, a lot of our, our kids can have um, challenges with vestibular processing, which is the receptors in your inner ear that tell you where you are in relationship to gravity. Are my upright? How fast am I moving? Um, and and so if they're sensitive, they want to be very grounded. So you think about maybe a toddler that you pick up and put in a high chair. All of a sudden, you've you've dysregulated them because mm. if, it's too, if it's too unpredictable and they don't have a system that can process that motor input very well, mm. um, that can be overwhelming. Um, uh, appropriate. Mm, so good. Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't familiar with done. moving. No, yeah, that, I mean, I wasn't familiar with that uh, one. That's this really is a big one. I think I see the most um, in proprioception proprioceptive processing is all of the input in your joints and muscles and it tells you about force and and it really is that body mapping it's that this is where I am on the map of life um, and again when I watch a, a child move it gives me information if I have a child who's not rotating mm, I'm kind of thinking maybe their tongue isn't quite rotating um, or these are children that have a hard time drinking from an open cup and they tend to just all or nothing instead of that nice graded movement or maybe they don't use utensils because tactile they don't want to get messy because they might spill or they just don't quite know where their mouth is mm. um, and that children that put too much in their mouth um, sometimes they need that extra input to figure out where things are or they don't quite know um, whether a food's safe to chew swallow um, okay, so, so there's a the whole variety Yes, that pocket, would you call um, that pocketing then if they're just like needing pocketing, sensory input? Absolutely. And when there's sensory processing, a lot of times I see children that also have difficulty um, with established motor um, development um, and especially mouth development. So if I have a baby who didn't do any mouthing um, and didn't get that non-nutritive ability to practice developing how to move my tongue and move things in my mouth, then we'll see challenges with being able to move food side to side. Um, so a lot of that motor development that is driven from a sensory processing place, because that's what drives us to explore our environments. If they don't get those rich experiences, then often I will see a sensory, um, uh, an oral motor and a sensory processing challenge. So. Okay, so what what does it typically look like working with occupational therapist and, um, you know, just, you know, so you could tell our, our audience what that those goals sure. would be. I mean, oh, that was so a lot fun. of stuff, but I guess obviously <laughs> you first need to assess what sensory piece that the child's struggling with and focus on it. Um, um, but yeah, what's the most typical that you, you see in some of those really struggling with food and how would you work with them? Oh. Well, you know, sometimes, you know, we dive right into the eating experience and um, other times we're working even away from the table because the table is so stressful. So um, when I evaluate a child, I'm, I'm looking at that whole body system. It's not just a mouth. I'm looking at how that child relationally plays, the dynamics with um, family, um, you know, what you know, what their nervous system is in play as far as do they like to move? Or are they more grounded and cautious or how they explore their environments? Because that's going to give me information, not only about that motor system and the sensory processing, but also just who they are. Because mm -hmm. um, I think temperament is a big piece. Um, uh, and then we, I, I do a lot of transition up to doing um, some just kind of messy play, maybe some bubbles. Bubbles are a great one because kids usually like them, but they also can give me information about do they pop the bubbles? Do they like to even get near the bubbles? Um, I look a lot at um, the mouth. So we might do some games to see if they can move certain structures of their mouth. Um, can they, um, how is their, their ability to breathe and do respiration? So we do a lot of blowing activities and everything is very play-based because we, we need things to be fun. We need them to be child driven. And um, we know as soon as things become stressful, then appetite decreases. And, and we really want this to be joyful for everybody involved. And then usually uh, we'll do a picnic at the table if we're able to get there. So, of mm -hmm. course, varies on individual child and where they're at um, in this journey on eating. OK, yeah, yeah um, definitely varies, of course, with the age and where they're at and what specifics. But uh, what are um, some strategies that you can suggest for parents um, to do it, to increase success with feeding when eating is not fun, just things that they can be doing at home? Oh, yes, yes. And that's the nice thing, too, is um, when I, I look at a lot of um, just things you can do, right, whether your child is over-responsive, under-responsive, there's just activities that can be very um, just organizing and, and calming and can just set your your child up for some success at the table. And depending on what age they are, obviously, I work from 
I work with babies on up to 17, 18. So, um, but in general, um, I think I think getting the body ready before coming to the table and getting some good movement, um, things that are activities that are muscle loading or pushing or pulling or maybe carrying something heavy or just getting some good um, jumping input um, really sets the nervous system. I think about if you have a range this small of regulating, the more that you can add the better, because now you're widening your range of being able to, to stay with something that may not be as as um, uh, as easy for your child. Um, I think the structure is really creating pre predictability within routine and schedule. And I know, Catherine, you talk a lot about that. And it's so essential for regulation, which is associated with sensory processing. So, um, and I, I do a lot of um, um, kind of mouth prep. And so that might look like bubble blowing. Um, it could look like um, there's lots of different blowing games, um, uh, blowing a cotton ball across the table, but just getting some of that respiration and breathing and really helping kids. I, I really try to encourage breathing from the belly button. So they get that nice full breath and not a shallow breath as our mm. kids are getting anxious towards mealtime. Everything's coming up here and they're, they're not getting that full regulatory support. Um, uh, whistles are great. Um, for some children, I actually use that as a transitional tool. Um, I call it a mouth box. And so mm. it might just have whistles and bubbles and maybe things to chew on. I mean, chew um, when with things that are appropriate, just getting that nice, rich input to your jaw can be organizing. So, and that's a great one that usually you can just set out there and they can be blowing whistles while you're getting the food ready mm -hmm. um, or getting ready to serve. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of, um, you know, hand washing routines or songs to get to the table can help build in a lot of predictability um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and, a, and a big thing too, um, the, the tactile processing, I think, is usually what I run into the most um, with with the ability to just interact with foods. And um, I try to be very sensitive to that at mealtimes. Mealtimes really are about family and exposure, which is rich and modeling positive eating behaviors. And I try to create opportunities away from the table to really do some of that messy play or food play or driving cars in in chocolate pudding and doing a car wash. I'll have water there. And if, if they need something, water is a great one to pair with messy play because it allows them to reset and then go back to it and then reset. Um, but I, I really encourage, you know, sometimes it's hard to set aside time to do just some, some, some sensory messy play. Um, sometimes it's hard for families to get messy. Yes, yeah, to allow messy. <laughs> That's a whole other okay. topic. I have yeah. strategies to help you be yeah. okay with your child being messy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I think it's really great that there's so much within routine that we can do. Um, having your child be a helper in the kitchen, washing broccoli, or you know, even at the store, being the one to hold the broccoli, broccoli and put it in the bag. Um, all of those things are contact, and they're tactile contact. Um, when you're doing messy play, just really thinking about tools are great. Tools are great. You can use a spoon. You can use tongs. And the great thing about tools is they get smaller. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can graduate them to smaller and smaller to where we're using our whole hand. So, mm -hmm. um, but there, a lot of the food and the interactions and just cooking and being together in, in the kitchen and helping to set up and bring foods to the table can be really big. Yeah. Um, do you like using like sensory bins? I do. I do. I really do. And parents and, making and their own sensory bin. Granted, when all this started, what, running out and getting rice and beans for a sensory bin that was a little <laughs> bit more difficult so we did get creative with that um but any kind of material because the biggest thing is we want the response to be i wonder with foods and it starts with um feasting with our eyes it starts with being able to to smell foods and know if they're big or little smells and being able to use all of our senses and helping kids navigate that so they understand that it, every one of those steps is a success it involves mm -hmm. your sensory system and um, and it helps parents, I think, redefine what try is and that try can simply be just being in the same room. And mm -hmm. um, and that's so much of what we do. It's hard to just isolate one part of your nervous system when it comes to food because it is multisensory and um, every interaction is a win. So mm -hmm. what's your thoughts on on gagging? I hear that a lot from from parents. Um, I mean, different situations. Certainly a young baby right. will gag, but even an older child, almost like. Um, almost like a learned response is like seeing a food, they start gagging right. before they even bring it in. Right, and we know, know that, that. Um, anxiety and sensory, they they kind of like to hang out together because it's chicken or egg. Um, <laughs> sometimes when you're more anxious, those sensory systems get more activated. Um, 
Uh, yeah, there's so many reasons for that gag. I mean, it could be just introducing a new texture. Um, it could be um, trying to figure out where it is in your mouth. Um, a lot of times we think that children avoid texture because it's how it feels. Um, and often it can be they don't know where it ends up in their mouth. Um, and so I'll get a gag when they're like, oh my goodness, it surprised me it was over here. And we call that a, an oral tactile discrimination. So being able to find where those things are. I give the analogy of uh, if you were shot up with Novocaine and somebody put a Cheerio in your mouth, you wouldn't be able to find it and that would make you feel pretty anxious. And so, um, mm -hmm. but um, helping, um, helping kids that stay in their thinking brain as much as possible, really helping um, them understand that they get to explore it on their own terms and that, um, and that it starts with their eyes and that, and, and really reinforcing that because you're right, a lot of, especially older kids, they're already preset to, oh, and they're working themselves up. And it, and I imagine if there was the worst food in the world in front of me, I'm, okay, I'm going to say oysters. <laughs> it's okay. You are allowed to not like a food, but for me, if somebody was saying, I have to have that, yeah, I'm already set up for it's going to come right back out because you uh, do, the more anxious you yeah. get, you bring that protective response forward. And so it makes it more um, important to help our kids have some tools about how they can be successful at exploring with it mm -hmm. so, and helping yeah. them identify what those are. Okay. Yeah. And so for like a young baby, um, it could just be they need more like um, chew toys or like pushing the gag reflex back. Right. And the mouthing, mouthing and um getting just getting in there and feeling it because a lot of times um, they'll touch it and they'll gag in response to just it being on their hands um, so just getting all of that exposure um, if it is a, a, a baby that has done very minimal if if any um, you know exploration by putting things in their mouth I mean that is such a de developmentally essential piece um, mm -hmm. if they didn't get those rich experiences then my guess is that Part of that is to push that gag back. And if they didn't get the experience, then I want to give them the experience so that they can start to figure out and push and desensitize and increase that space that they're able to put things in their mouth as well. So, mm -hmm. so then uh, there's that sensory oral motor connection because it's hard sometimes to tease those out because they just, they, the sensory supports the exploration, which builds the skill. Mm -hmm. so. and it's helpful to know that there can be so many component components involved. I mean, when I'm talking to families about picky eating, it's often like more can be a marathon than a quick sprint, especially oh, yeah. when we have the whole sensory system involved. Um, I mean, do you, I mean, what's your expectation of that kind of turning around on someone that you're working with? Is it oh. better they start early? And um, it is. Kind of I, I really encourage families if, if you know, they're, they're going along and they're, they're struggling, uh, you know, have somebody have eyes and evaluate somebody who specializes in feeding just to get that big picture. And maybe it's just simply providing some recommendations or maybe we need more of that um, intervention. And, it, it is a dance, I, it is definitely the marathon, not, not the race. And, um, you know, by having those tools and, and making sure that, that our kids can further develop the tools, helps them develop the foundation that's gonna continue on over time and be more successful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I kind of lost the question here, did I answer it? Yeah, yeah, you did. I mean, it's not, not I, I know it's not an easy, so. easy question because, <laughs> everyone's very different with what they're coming in for. Um, right, sometimes, right. sometimes and, just the expectation that, um, you know, just, you know, committing just to, to work on something starting sooner versus putting it off can certainly get, get them right. to the finish line sooner than. And um, sometimes you need a professional to get in there and do that dance with that sensory system, because I, if we push too much and we shut down, then we don't change any neurochemistry. If we mm -hmm. can set a child up to push to that just right challenge, then then we slowly start to make um, that change and help them develop and push through. And sometimes mm -hmm. that push the challenge is a tricky place to know where to go. Um, and so that's where it can be beneficial to have somebody who has that training and that lens. Um, but of course, keeping it playful and fun. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's okay. so playful, they don't know they're being challenged. <laughs> yes, yes. And that okay. is the dance. <laughs> that is definitely the goal with I know the idea of blowing cotton balls. That sounds kind of fun that a lot of those <laughs> playful activities, um, it's, you know, you have to think about like blowing bubbles, how that can be fun. Um, talk to me a little bit about different kind of cups, cups 
I mean, you know, yeah. drink it from a straw or an open cup or a lid, um, a, a sippy, how that can all different motor skills oh. and advanced. Oh, skills. absolutely. Well, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to start by saying, if you can avoid a sippy cup, avoid a sippy cup. I, um, it's a transition. I mean, we want our kids to transition away from um, an immature suck. Um, and so bottling, there, there's a need for it because you don't have that skill. But once that skill to transition away is there, we really want kids to work on being able to move their lips separate of their, their jaw and start to get their tongue in a more um, uh, positive, um, effective position that's gonna support them for eating. So I'm a huge proponent for straw cups um, with that being said, I like to make sure to test out your straw cups because some of those, those nice handy ones, it, it is really hard. Mm. <laughs> I don't know some of those straws are like, Ooh, those are pretty tricky. But, um, so I'm a huge proponent for straws. I like it from an oral motor standpoint. I also like it because I think it is when you incorporate suck, it is a huge calming organizing input. Our mouth is where we first organize in the world and we still do it as adults. We just more sophisticated. Um, and in open cup drinking, I think that's a huge one too. And it really helps with starting to think about some of the lip movement needed for spoon use. So open cup straw, love them. Um, when kids are learning about open cup drinking, sometimes a smaller cup where they can see the water is great. Um, so they can kind of figure out how um, how to tilt it enough so they, they get it in their mouth and have success and they don't flood themselves. And I usually start with a little bit of water or whatever the beverage of choice is. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's great. Um, Cause yeah, I see so many families staying on the sippy cup forever. It's, it's hard. It's hard and, because they are convenient. And, and I, I guess if, if, if that's a hard transition, cause I always like to honor where families are at um, and uh, then at least pop that valve out. Yeah. <laughs> the but at least pop yes. that valve out. So they're not getting that same suck that they would use with bottling. Um, and for some kids, if they get attached to another thing, you have more work to transition them off of it. So, mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I'm like, if you know a transition from one thing to the next is going to be difficult, then just go right to where you, you want to end up. Um, and so straws and open cups are great for that. Mm -hmm. okay. And the, the sports bottles, the Camelback bottles for the, some of the older kids. Oh, okay. Uh, those are great. Cause, um, again, there's three components to organizing with the mouth and it's choose, suck and blow. All of those have so much, um, great, just calming input and support. Um, and when you think about that, it's bite and, and it's, it's bite and suck. So now you're getting two in there. So it's kind of a double whammy. So for kids that need to, to have better regulatory support, that's a great one to have available. And it's, it's appropriate. It's what kids have. Even okay. my, my older kids, um, well, when you could be in the classroom, that's what I would encourage is if they could have a little sports bottle with them, that they could get that bite and uh -huh. stuff and help with their attention. Yeah. So, so definitely just by the tools they use at home can help strengthen oral yeah. skills and make, work on those. Um, and I was going to add, um, sorry to interrupt, yeah, no, straws, go ahead. Um, if you, um, you can play around with the length of a straw, so the, the curly straw, so the longer the straw, you're going to have to have a little bit more organization here, and you're going to have to have more respiratory support and posture to be able to suck up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, short, narrow straws, like cocktail straws are sometimes fun. Um, I do use those a lot if I'm doing smoothies and kids are kind of not quite sure if they use a cocktail straw, it's just a little bit. And if they get that taste, it's not so overwhelming. Oh, that's, that's a, that's a good tip. Oh, but they're <laughs> fun too. The cocktail straws, they're fun. Tools. That's keeping it fun. <laughs> we have a lot of creative opportunities for kids with tools, tiny tasters, toothpicks, swords, anything. All the, it's a great way to take the expectation oh, down yeah. and that just right challenge. So I've, I've seen that recently, the little tiny taster spoons. And oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a great little, little tip as in oh, how those little like swords. Those are great. No, yeah, um, where it just takes the information. Yeah, yeah, takes the intimidation away when just trying it and exposing and being in it. And so cu currently, Donna, you're you're working um, primarily virtually um, through Bold Pediatrics. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, just briefly, how does that work for you at home? And how, you know, some families well, have questions like, how does that, that work having? I have to say, OT? well, you know, really, obviously, we didn't have much choice in this. But um, in any opportunity, I always think there's something that can I can glean from it. And um, it's actually been wonderful as far as feeding because families and, and their children are in their natural environment. And, um, you know, in the clinic, I mean, I can do a lot of work and it is beneficial. But now I have this value of really being with a family during times that are not always um, without stress. And most times they're very stressful. And to be able to help 
see the environment, see the setup, and implement some immediate strategies directly in the context of their, their home environment has actually been really, really powerful. Um, and you know, maybe that might be just coaching a, a parent um, working on some self-feed and, and expansion of texture with a baby, or maybe it's working with a, a, a younger child who has really limited repertoire, very anxious, doesn't want to be a part of any kind of food interaction in the home, and we're able to set that up. So often I'll email, and based off of what our plan is and our goals, I'll say, okay, today we're going to, and um, and definitely being sensitive to what families have in their home and um, being able to get the store is not easy. So I try to really right. do it. There's a lot more planning involved, but it, I have to say, I really love it. I know that eventually I, I miss my direct care because mm -hmm. <laughs> I like to just have my hands on things. But I would definitely say that this is a really positive thing to incorporate it into any feeding program, even when we go back to direct, because to have that connection in the home is mm -hmm. very powerful. Yeah. And with yeah, so it's been being, great. I'm learning. Yeah. I've learned a lot. And and like I said, there's there's been a big positive in all of it. Yeah. And with kids being home, it's been a good time to work on feeding and right. um, when they're not as busy and overbooked with all the other things. So right. that Which has that, been part of it. To your point has been really nice as well is that mm -hmm. kids have that time um, mm -hmm. and giving them things that they can do directly within okay. their environment. Yes, for yeah. sure. So if people come in and watch later and they post a comment, um, your Donna's in the group. So if people yep. are watching this later, um, certainly just, uh, Give us a you know hashtag replay and let us know where you're from and give us a question. You can tag Donna if you have a question for her. And um, and you, if you want to find out more about Donna, she's at Bold Pediatrics in Beaverton. And um, certainly um, Kim is the owner there that you can uh, Kim contact. Kim Raffin and Sandra Helen uh -huh. Foster. Mm -hmm. And we okay. do have a website, um, yeah. boldpediatricstherapy.com. So mm -hmm. it gives a lot of information about philosophy and our feeding mm -hmm. program. And mm -hmm. um, just grateful to work with uh, some amazing clinicians. Yes, yes. Well, and I know, I know not everyone in the group here is from Oregon, but a lot are. I don't know how that works out of state working virtually, but probably <laughs> still do it. <laughs> At least I know. Definitely I, I have I, to make people that are where I'm licensed, so it would be yes, hard. But yes, yes. you still answer questions and um, yes. it's even help you get connected with somebody in your in your home state. Yes, that sounds great. Well, this has been very informative. Yeah. I know that our time would just zap up because there's I so know. many questions I wanted to ask you. So yeah, we'll maybe both, do this. So. Maybe we'll do this again in the future. But I appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day. And um, if anyone has questions, just leave them in the comments. And thank you all very much. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.